Welcome back to Believe in Softball. I'm your host, Jenna Becerra. And honestly, I've just been smiling from ear to ear after watching back-to-back weekends of college softball. The first weekend, it sort of felt like a dream, like, is this real? But having a second weekend really made it feel more real. And I also made it back in the booth calling Stanford softball games on the Pac-12 broadcast. So it just feels good after all this time. And I know softball season feels good for you too. So some reminders for the show, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Believe in Softball, that's B-L-E-A-V. Subscribe to Believe in Softball on YouTube so you can watch the episodes too. All right, let's go through today's order. Covering our bases, we'll start off there with news and updates to get us started. Then we'll head into today's interview with Calista Balco, who's a Wildcat alum from down in Tucson. She knows how to win and she gives us a peek into that, which is great. And we'll wrap things up with the foul tip of the week, our new segment that shares tips to help us get better as players, as coaches, but most importantly, as people. So let's jump in. Covering our bases. So we're obviously most excited about softball season, duh, but it's also so nice to have a bunch of sports going on right now again, college basketball, the NBA, the NHL, what have you. And really the go-to place to bet on these sports is betonline.ag. But for you movie buffs, TV bingers, and even if reality TV is one of your guilty pleasures, like me, BetOnline also covers awards, TV shows, and yes, reality TV. They have hundreds of props with real-time odds on almost anything you can imagine, and the casino is open 24-7. So head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. That's betonline.ag, betonline, your online sportsbook experts. And let's just get back to college softball, right? Like highlights from this past weekend, there were some upsets and just some great performances. And what I'm about to go over is just some of many, some highlights, just to keep in mind going into this coming weekend. So first, Washington lost to Nevada, upset. Clemson beat Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech actually did take the series against Florida State, however. Missouri lost to Iowa State. McNeese beat Arkansas once, played them a couple times. And LSU lost to Alabama twice. Now, that's not necessarily an upset. Alabama is ranked higher. However, it's a really interesting SEC preview we had going on. So first, Oklahoma jumped up into the top three of the coaches poll. Now Alabama leapfrogs Washington into that number four slot. But I have to give a call out and give some defensive love. You know I love good defense. Georgia Tech actually turned a triple play. So runners on first and second. The shortstop, Jin Saleo, catches the line drive, tags the runner at second, and throws to first to get the runner who left the back. I just, I love it. And I saw the clip from ACC Network. It was amazing. And yes, you heard me right. Triple play. Not double play. Triple play. But also some great diving catches in center field. I have to give some love to my Audis. You know, the Pittsburgh center fielder, Hunter Levesque, she made two diving catches to her left and her right. Oregon's Haley Cruz had a game-saving catch against Fresno State. And over at McNeese, Tony Perrin had one against Arkansas. So just lots of great defense. And that's what I like to see, especially after so long, since they've been able to actually practice and train and play games like this. It's great. Another thing that I wanted to really call out, something that stood out to me, was the mentality of Alabama and Montana Fouts, one of their star pitchers. It's just important, and it really speaks a lot to what we're going to see on the field. So she and her team had a different start to last season than they would have hoped for, and that they're used to being the Alabama Crimson Tide. You know, they had eight losses just in that short season, and they really wanted everything. You know, they wanted to go the distance. They were focused on that. But this season, the mentality has really changed. And Montana Fouts did an interview with Softball America. And she said, she realized and her team realized, like, we can't look at the bigger picture. The difference between our team this year is that we take it inning by inning, because we're not promised tomorrow. And you know, with COVID-19 and the short season last year, she said they just realized how much they love and need each other as teammates. And lo and behold, on the field, that stuff translates. You know, Fouts and Sarah Cornell combined for a perfect game in the 2021 season opener against Alabama State. You know, that's how it works out. And it starts at the top. 
you know, something she mentioned too, is that head coach Patrick Murphy and the staff just really cares about them and their development as people off the field too. So it makes it really, really easy to play for them. And when you have that perspective throughout your team, your staff, everyone, it just really simplifies things. And Fout said it best. She said, it's about loving the game. And I think we're going to focus on loving each and every game. And I think that's the way to do it. So I love that. And I want to keep an eye on them throughout the season. Another cool thing that I wanted to call out is that Athletes Unlimited came out with a new web series. It's called Hitting Home. And it's a six part series about representation in softball. So it features Athletes Unlimited pro softball players, AJ Andrews, Alicia Ocasio, Kelsey Stewart, Michelle Moultrie, and Jasmine Jackson. And there are a couple episodes in right now to the series. And in the first one, they all discuss how the number one person that really inspired them when they were growing up was Natasha Watley. Just as a black softball player who was the best at what she did and a leader on the field and off. And it just made them know, hey, we can do this too. And look where they are now. So pretty cool. And in the second episode, they talk about barriers to entry for young players of color. And it's just a fantastic perspective for everybody in terms of understanding better, but also knowing how we can make things different. So more great content to come. Important conversations are being had that are really timely, of course, during Black History Month, but they're also a lot bigger than that because this really is every single day in our community. So I'm looking forward to the rest of the series. You can see it on Athletes Unlimited YouTube or on their Instagram at AU Pro Softball. Now with all of that good stuff, let's go ahead and head into today's interview. She is currently the Director of Regional Development at the University of Arizona Athletic Department. And of course, a Wildcat alum, former catcher, and two-time national champion, Calista Balco Elmore. Thank you for joining. Absolutely, very excited to be here. Of course, and I, I had to include your married name, even though to me, you know, you're Calista Balco <laughs> in my head, but yeah. I'm like, well, we need to reflect the current state. Absolutely, <laughs> that's, if you know me from softball, you know me as Balco, and, and typically people in the softball community call me Callie. So if I run into someone and I can't quite remember where I knew them from, if they say Callie, I'm like, they knew me from softball. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. Everybody in softball always called me JB. So mm-hmm. yeah. when, now if people call me JB, it's automatically same thing as you go right back yeah. to that. But if someone that I knew from softball calls me Jenna, I'm like, wait, who are you talking to? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Well, I think we just missed overlapping with each other, playing against okay. each other in the pack. Um, Cause you graduated in 08, right? Yeah. So I grad, I, my last year at softball was 08 and then I graduated from college in 09, but I played four years, 04 to 08. Mm-hmm. What year were you, okay. what years were you there? So I was class of 2012. So okay. if your last year finishing up your degree would have been my freshman year, 2009. Okay. And yeah. we actually played Arizona in postseason. We hosted U of A at Super Regionals. Still not over it because we lost at the end, but you know, whatever. <laughs> they were probably good. cheering them on. Yeah. At the time. So that's fine. <laughs> good time. Yeah. Well, it, for you guys, it was good times right. I, right. <laughs> that year, but yes. Yeah. Well, there was, I mean, the last 10 years, it's definitely been some, a, different experience as an Arizona softball alum, some, some highs, but a lot of lows. Uh, so hopefully this year we'll come out of that, but I'm sure you've experienced that as an alum too. Oh, totally. And it is kind of, it's a different lens too. It's like, you're still as invested Mm -hmm. in a way as you were when you played, but you, you're, you know, you're not on the field. So it's not like you have control. So exactly. That's a huge point is if, it's almost worse when you're on the other end because you can't do anything about it. And, you know, you want more control. Yeah. <laughs> Especially as a catcher, I think sometimes, you know, that's like a natural um, characteristic of a catcher is, is being able and having the desire to be in control. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're used to leading the, the, not only being on the yeah. field, but leading the whole team yeah. while you're on the field to being like, okay, now I'm in the stands. Like this Watch is an amazing you. facility but <laughs> very hard to do. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. I mean, when you look at kind of softball as a whole, actually Arizona softball, but softball in general too, over this last 10 year span that we've seen, how do you feel like it's evolved? Uh, Good question. I think the first thing that comes to mind is that the, the playing field has really leveled out nationally. So you know, when I was there, that was just kind of starting. So it typically in the past had been, you know, all the, before me, especially it was just UCLA and Arizona um, in the nineties, you know, and I'm not saying that other universities weren't competitive. It's just kind of, if you thought of softball, you thought of those, those two dynasties. Um, And I think that, you know, sheds light on California because, California for so many years and decades just and still is producing the the most competitive softball athletes and then softball's really started becoming more popular nationwide because of tv and so then I noticed that too right when I left that when I would go to travel and do clinics on the east coast coaches were talking about this sport was really not very popular five years ago. And then, you know, when I was leaving college and coaching in 08, 09, 10, I mean, it was, it was starting a boom in the Southeast. And then you start seeing support from the SEC, right? When you've got these great football programs that can come in and pay a softball coach, like at Alabama, Florida, Georgia, right? These teams start Tennessee, they start coming kind of out of nowhere in the mid 2000s and and their powerhouses. And so, you know, there's a lot of layers to why and how this happens, but it, it starts in the younger programs where softball starts becoming more popular. And then the higher level, right? There's more support to support the program. Oh, absolutely. And with your role now with the athletic department, Uh obviously this is across the board with all of Arizona athletics, but how do you kind of plug in to, I guess, contribute to that support for the sports? So a huge part of my job, which is really my, I, I love my job. First of all, I make it clear in development. I, I fundraise for the athletic department. So um, I help with, really connecting with donors in the community that have certain passions about different sports. So I'll meet a lot of, a lot with, with folks who want to support the softball program. And of course there's like an in immediate connection. Um, we could talk, talk about softball for days on end <laughs> and to find that connection. And then to find that that person's in a position where they can support the program. It's been for me as an alum and as somebody who who is so passionate about the student athlete experience, I mean, there's so much benefit to that experience post-college, especially for a young lady. So for me to be able to serve the university and serve the athletic department, that was so good to me and my husband and my family. And to be able to make those connections with people in the community um, who share the same passion. I mean, I've been doing it for seven years. I don't have any plans to leave. And it's, we're so blessed to be able to stay involved the way that we've been to stay involved. Oh yeah. Because to your point, like the softball program at Arizona obviously has such a rich history. Yeah. Really the whole athletic department does too. Like there's so much there, you know, with basketball and, and all the other sports. It's a big part of the Pac-12. And I know in our day it was the Pac-10, but (laughs) whatever. (laughs) I know I had to, I had to get used to that. It took me a couple of years to say (laughs) Pac-12. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're moving with the times we were catching up, but you know, you mentioned in the nineties, for example, UCLA and Arizona were really the, the places to be. For yeah, the pow- for sure, the powerhouses, yeah. Yeah, and th- there's no denying that. Nobody would, would dispute that. But I feel like Arizona's had, you know, more than one peak like that, and you were part of one of them with yeah. the back-to-back championships in 06 yeah. and 07. So I would ask you, you know, what were some of your favorite memories through that experience? A lot of good memories, a lot of hard memories, too. I think 
I like to kind of intertwine them because the bad, you know, the hard, the grind, the waking up. I mean, there would be days where, you know, I'm kind of going down the, not a positive path, but you'll see how it intertwines. Um, all the hard and all the days I woke up and thought, should I be doing this or rolling out of bed, which I'm sure you can relate to because you're so sore. You've never been that sore <laughs> in your life, right? The grind on the field where, I mean, we had a really pit bull like culture on the field and I was very soft and, and tender hearted when I came in as a freshman. And the so that experience my freshman year really built who I am today. It built thick skin, you know, in the right situations. Like it also built a more empathetic person because I understood what it was like to be on the receiving end, right, of seniors and juniors just letting you have it every day. Um, and so I think I became a better person for it. And I, I'm sure you can relate and a lot of girls who have played that the freshman year is unlike anything I will ever experience. And, and I can say at Arizona too, that when you have that type of dynasty and culture, there is an expectation. And when you walk in, I will, you know what the expectation is. And if you, if you don't, it's, it's shoved down your throat the first year. I mean, really and truly. And so, um, the hard times I think are really to me, like I keep it close to my heart because I'm like, that's really what made me be successful and fight and push and, and not give up. You know, I mean, there were like so many days my freshman year, I thought, I thought about giving up and I think learning how to overcome that and understand what it takes to win and understand that when you're on the field, it's different than when you're off the field. And that if you can learn how to separate those personalities, I call it, like I have a way different personality when I play. Um, once you learn how to separate that and understand that it's okay to be this way on the field, um, it, it really opens the floodgates to what you can do. What I love about your answer is I asked you what your favorite memories are. And I love that you immediately went into, these aren't just positive, happy memories. Like they're my favorite memories because of what I got out of them. Mm -hmm. So like, 100%. I love that. I love the fact that that's the way that you answered. And it makes sense. It's on brand for that culture that you were a part of, but that you also help build. Too. Yeah. Oh yeah. And there's such a sense of pride, you know, looking back, like that culture and dynasty was built on those, on blood, sweat, and tears, but also on that day-to-day, -day just ugly grind sometimes. And I think it's hard for me because alum, outsider looking in now, like when you're a fan and, and you watch, like people would always say, you know, it just looks like rainbows and butterflies. And it, it does like when you're, when you're watching ESPN and you're watching Arizona, you're watching Stanford or whoever it is, you know, everybody looks like their best friend on the field. And, and there's, you know, people are smiling and <laughs> everything's grand and, and it sure as hell can be, you know, it sure as hell can be, but you don't get to that point without, you know, working through those trials and tribulations every single day. Oh yeah. I feel like that's how for me and, and sounds like for you too, it's like, that's how you learn to be a professional, right? Mm -hmm. Like it, it's weird. Cause oh, yeah. it's technically we're paying amateur softball here, but it's, you're learning how to be a professional where it's like, okay, I'm a professional. Th this is my team. This is what we're doing on the field, no matter what's happening yeah. off the field. Like yeah. that's kind of where you get that basis for the rest of your life. So many times my husband and I talk about this, I swear daily, the transferable skills are, and I'm such a believer in playing a sport, even if you're not athletic, Agree. <laughs> I, like play a sport and, you know, if parents are out there, keep your kids in a sport is not that I'm an experienced parent, but as a player and somebody that had the experience, you just can learn so much about yourself and become better for it. 
Absolutely. And I have to say, I agree about freshman year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so oh, with what you said. It's, it's yeah. a wake up call. Yeah. It's a yeah. wake up call. Absolutely. I mean, you walk in so blind, but it doesn't matter what sport you're in. It's like that for everybody. And, um, you know, Arizona, I'm sure was different than a lot of schools. Um, but I hear a pretty common theme when I talk to other girls, you know, who played. Yeah, of course, because oh, yeah. that, yeah, this is just something, this is one of those universal experiences mm -hmm. that yeah. we have when you, when you get to that level for sure. And, but the thing about that though, is I don't know, you know, we like to say and like on TV, on ESPN, they'll talk a lot about how Arizona went back to back, how, you know, I think Florida <laughs> like almost had a three peat, right? Like, mm -hmm. and, and we tout those things. But it's one thing to win a championship or to just succeed at a high level at anything. It's another thing to do it again. Right. And Very hard because you got a target on your back. Exactly. So what do you think? I mean, obviously a lot of the, this, these pieces to the culture that you're talking about, but what was that kind of big factor mm -hmm. or factors that got you guys to do that again? I can answer that really quickly because <laughs> there it's a secret, but it's not a secret. I, we never, ever felt, and I can genuinely say this without hesitation. This was the first team I had ever been on in my entire life where it, we'd be down by five and you'd walk into the dugout. You'd have no idea we were down by five in the sixth inning. Like that's seriously how we were. We had no reservations that like we couldn't just come up and get six runs because we did it. And, and we could, so we knew we could do it. Um, like, I remember, uh, again, I told you, I, I was joking with you earlier that I'm kind of bad with some of the details on some teams. <laughs> My memory is like not quite there, but we were in a postseason game. Um, and I want to say that this was, oh, six. Um, and we were down by five and it was like the fifth inning. And I, I remember walking into the dugout and just feeling this like weird sense of ease. Like we got this and looking around and all the girls were just like, yeah, like we got it. We just weren't worried. I mean, I'm sure coach was kind of like, Do we have to wait until the fifth inning. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he always said to us when I was playing in, in that, era in that time frame from 04 to 08 we always joked he would give us like the most backhanded compliment he would say you're the least talented team I've ever had but <laughs> you have like the most chemistry and I think there was definitely like a couple years there where we really did have that chemistry but we played so many games with our back against the wall and we just didn't stop fighting and I loved that part of the culture was we were fighters and like competitors and just, like I said, nine pit bulls on the field, just all with the same goal. Right. And we all yeah. wanted to win. You know, we all really liked that feeling and we loved competing on the field. I have to say that from my experience competing against the program, that one thing that always stood out to me was, you you're using the word pit bull. I think that's better, but I always thought of it as almost like this mean streak, but like a productive mean streak, not a, uh, not in a bad way. way. Putting it. Yeah. Yeah. But just that, like, no, this Edge. is how it's going to be. Yeah. <laughs> and that was something that I actually think, you know, we could have used more of at Stanford. We were a little too like over analytical and, and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. And that's something that, um, i I always, felt like was not that Arizona is the only program that has that, but it, it really right. did it well, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, it's interesting hearing you say that because coach Kendrea always really, you know, instilled in us that like when a team walks through that gate, it's not, are we going to win? Like we don't want them to think that there's even a chance. And like, <laughs> Coach really just had this, like, I mean, he's so competitive and I love him for it because he really taught us, like, I mean, losing to him is just, it's not an option. 
And even when we would win, I'm not joking. We'd win by seven, eight runs or we'd blow someone out in five innings, like, you know, with a run roll, he would, he would leave. We'd, we'd be in the outfield, like for our team meeting afterwards. And you would have thought we lost <laughs> the way he's like, you should have, you should have had 10 runs in inning two. Like, and then we'd be like, oh my gosh, like we thought, we thought we actually performed there. And so the next game, you just wanted to impress him more and more. And, and, you know, he's the type of coach that you want to please, right? Like, um, and you want to impress him. And so that, that just gave you even more of that edge of like, you know, Arizona's across our chest. When you walk through those gates, like you're going to, we wanted people to feel like how, how much are we going to lose by that's, and that's that pit bull mentality that we're talking about good, bad, or ugly. I'm just letting it out there that that's what was, you know, that's yeah. what was being discussed. And, and, um, you kind of have to have that if you're going to make it all the way to the end. Yeah. It's like, you gotta be a little bit savage. You like, <laughs> and you have to, to your point, like you have to already believe it before it happens. Yeah. And you guys already did. That's why it's like you manifest, like manifestation is a real thing. <laughs> it is. And I'll tell you this real quick, this, cause it just reminds me, I was saying earlier, like, I think when you really learn how to separate, you know, I was, I, when I was teaching kids, like, it's almost like you're an actress when you're on the field, like you can be who you want to be on the field. And then when you step off the field, like, that's when reality sets in. Like you need, you know, you can't be the same person on the field as you are off the field. Like, right. um, but teaching kids to be able to bring out that edge, like let it out. Don't be shy when you're on that field. I mean, I'm not going to say anything goes, but, but you really have to be able to pull that out of yourself and then walk off the field and be kind. And there was this coach that I met in high school. I was playing for this team and they just picked me up for the national tournament. And I spent seven hours with him on a layover. And so of course we really got to know each other. And he goes, you know, I'm going to be honest with you and I'll censor this a little bit. He's <laughs> like, I thought you were the biggest, you know, B. <laughs> by watching and playing against you. And I've had seven hours with you and you're so kind and you're sweet and you're nice. And I was laughing because I'm like, oh my gosh. And at the time I never really clicked with me, but like, that's what I'm saying is you have to be able to have those two, you know, separate it. <laughs> Absolutely. You're right now. You're making me think like you said, like actresses or like entertainers, artists, I'm thinking of like Beyonce and Sasha Fierce. <laughs> totally. Oh my gosh. I know that story with her too. And I, <laughs> It's true. I think that that carries over into being an athlete. Like you don't have to be, you know, you got to be able to figure out how to have that edge so you can make it all the way. Yeah. That's such a good point. Really, really good point. And with you, you you've mentioned Kendra a few times because how can you not like right. he's, he is Arizona softball. Right. Yeah. But what's cool in your case too, is that you actually played for him, but played with the rest of the coaching staff that's at Arizona now, like you have Karen Moat, you have Caitlin Lowe, Caitlin. like you guys oh, were yeah. kind of like the blonde era back then. I feel like Caitlin's <laughs> changed her hair so a little true. bit, but yeah. <laughs> we always joke, remember. like, you have to be blonde when we always made that joke, like coach only recruited blonde, which he didn't. Let me preface that. It just <laughs> happened to work out that way. But then when, after, I think it was like, Oh, eight, we started having a lot more brunettes. And so we, we were teasing about that. Like, the era is changing. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. But it's interesting because they were pit bulls with you too, right? Mm -hmm. And especially with you and Taryn because of that battery relationship that you have. But yes. So when you kind of, we talked about like the evolution of softball, when you look, think back to when you guys played and how they are now sort of I guess not having to move with the times, but kind of like they're yeah. having to ride that wave. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. How, what do you see them doing well, you know, in that regard? So I think the biggest to just touch on the change in the culture in softball and, you know, it's across the board with, it's not just in sports. It's just with kids in general is, is the major one is social media, right? So you get the, you, 
that affects a lot. And in one way that it affects softball is, um, you know, the girls, they just crave to be liked. Um, and I think kids do in general these days because there's so much out there that they're seeing and reading and oftentimes it's about themselves. And so I think the, the kicker for coaches is being able to teach the girls, like I said earlier, kind of how to separate, like it's okay if people are saying negative things about you or your performance, you know, you have to be able to accept that and be okay with that and not spend your time on social media seeing what people are saying about you. Because as a female, you know, I, my husband and I were talking about this a couple of days ago. Females play, coach always taught us this. Females play good when they feel good. And men, they have to play good to feel good. Mm. And so if you're, you know, in this day and age, like not feeling good about yourself as a woman and you're 17, 18, 19, it's going to be really hard for you to perform. Um, and I noticed that I definitely noticed that. And I noticed that when my teammates were having a hard time in their lives, you would see that trickle down into their performance. Um, so to just kind of go back to your question, I think it's balancing all the pressures of social media for these kids and helping them learn how to have thick skin and not feel nervous even on the field at practice to say something to their teammate, um, right? You pick it up, right? Or if someone's being lazy or not hustling, like I think this era has a hard time I don't want to say calling someone out, but let's call a spade a spade. That's what it is. Like, which my era didn't have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and that I think was the hard part as a freshman understanding to not take that personal, but understanding that the purpose of that is to make you all better. Right. And the expectations here. And if I don't say something, that means that expectations not here. Right. Right. It's like, how, this is how we uphold that standard. <laughs> like it yes. needs to be communicated. Yeah. And it, and it needs to be illustrated like publicly that this, you know, this isn't acceptable. Um, this isn't what we do here. Um, some girls did it better than others, you know, and I think that's where the leadership came into play is it's a tricky thing to be able to communicate that and get respect, you know, rather than get, kickback. Um, so that's where you find your leadership. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense when it comes to catcher specifically, I feel like I've noticed some changes or things that have evolved over the years. What stands out to you about catching now versus before? Physically, <laughs> I think, I mean, honestly, that's the first thing that kind of comes to mind. Um, you know, not that that needs to be focused on, but I think you're looking at catchers and, and you can see this in the sport of golf, like golfers look way more athletic now than they looked 20 years ago. And mm. so they're taking their, they're taking the physical aspect about the game more seriously. Right. And they're training harder. And you see that in catchers now. I mean, back in the day, coaches just, you know, they wanted their, the, the kiddo that was a little bigger behind home plate in the sense of, and it was the same for baseball, the, the more, the, the bigger, the mass, if you will. And um, the, the more chance of that protection occurring at the plate where you see now coaches are looking for, I mean, of course, a strong right catcher, but it lean athletic, uh, agile. Um, so you're seeing like kind of a, a difference in that. Um, when it comes to anything outside of that, nothing comes to mind initially, but as you know, cat catchers and pitchers, but I think catchers, everybody's looking at you. So you kind of have to set the tone and everybody does, but I took it really seriously that that was an expectation and you're in a very, you're in one of the leadership positions on the center of the field. Yeah. And 
in terms of, to your point, like kind of physique, Yeah, I felt, I always, with the era that you played in, that was a time where, like you're saying, like there was a certain size expectation behind the plate, but I always kind of loved that, that necessarily you didn't fit into just that box yeah, at the time. Yeah, I always said that whenever I would go coach somewhere afterwards, like you don't look like a catcher. And I was like, <laughs> it was always like funny to me because I'm like, catchers should be able to move quickly and, um, you know, position themselves and get real low. And, um, you know, so I, I did start noticing after that, like you look at the young lady right after I was there at, at Florida. I mean, I should know her name, just stud catcher. I mean, she was tall, thin, lean, um, and she was a boss behind the plate. Right. And then I remember there was a lefty catcher at Washington when we were there, like, when do you see a left-handed catcher? <laughs> um, but she was amazing. Right. And she didn't let that inhibit her. I mean, there's some positions you just can't be left-handed at, like, it's just not possible the older you get, but, um, so you start to see just some changes, like you said, in the physique, I think. Yeah. Because the, this is a thing that one of the things I really love about softball is that I don't, no matter what your body type is, like there is, you can play, Oh you yeah. can do it. And if you can hit, first of all, then great. You're, <laughs> like, you're, you're in, <laughs> but I think even defensively, d- you know, dep- whatever your skills are, it doesn't matter. There's a place that you can fit into this Absolutely. game and a certain position doesn't have to be a specific way. And, you know, like we can broaden our minds beyond that, but that's something that with softball that I think is so cool. It's like, there are so many different body types. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, we would joke when we were in the halls of McHale, which is just like the hub for athletes, kind of where all the athletes locker rooms are. I mean, you'd be able to walk down the hall and you'd coach that's a swimmer. Um, that's a golfer. Like it was funny because right. you just did over time when you develop your skill, like everybody kind of starts to look the same, but you're right. In softball, it's like all different shapes and sizes and heights, you know, like when I would coach, there'd be like these little, little teeny, you know, petite, short, small, and there's a spot for her. Like they'd be nervous. I said, have her slap. You know, if yeah. you think she's not going to like develop physically to be able to be a power hitter, Coach Kendrea developed slapping and that, like you said, that gives an avenue for another girl and second base, right? That's a perfect position for someone who's more petite and not built, you know, with strong shoulders and and solid thighs, right? Um, It's like, hey, you can play second and you can, and there's a place for you. Yeah, absolutely. I never thought of it like that. That's kind of a good point. There's a place for everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause I agree with you. Like you can tell like, okay, she's either on the volleyball team or the basketball team. (laughs) Right. Like there, there's certain things about that. Yeah. Like the gymnasts. Okay. We can tell, you know, (laughs) but just in college, you know, you just, you're training so much that you're all training the same. So you all kind of start to look the same and, and it was, it was just funny. Yeah. I agree. Well, speaking of looking the same, I wanted to ask you, I've always liked Arizona's uniforms. So I'm curious yes. what your favorite wow. uniform is. The white one. The white, the all white. Our home, our home uniform is just something so classic about it. I love Arizona's colors and I love that coach kept the traditional uniform. I have to tell this story. He, so we have white, I mean, when I played white Navy and I think that was it. And so gray came into the mix before I got there and the team was run rule. The first game they played in the gray uniform and those uniforms were never used (laughs) since. So you want to talk about, you know, coaches competitiveness, but also a little bit of that. um, What's the word I'm looking for? His superstition superstition. Oh yeah. There's that that's in the game of baseball, you know? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Funny to see an investment in that. And then nope, we're, we're not pulling those puppies out again. (laughs) I've had plenty of similar experiences, not with the uniform specifically. That is a little bit next level, but like it is, (laughs) we went to, um, 
this breakfast place that's in Palo Alto, technically Menlo Park, but it's close by uh, the university grounds and it's called Stacks. And I remember we went and we, I think we swept that weekend. It was like a preseason tournament or something. Yeah. So for the entire rest of my time at Stanford, every pregame breakfast was at Stacks, no matter what. <laughs> Uh, so it's just so how it is, right? It's yeah. you just get in those funky habits and the, oftentimes they go on for years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I don't think any of us apologize for it. <laughs> no, it's, that's a fun part of the game. It's a fun part of the game. It's just a little quirk of the game. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like I know that you mentioned your husband a few times and I know that he is a football alum from Arizona. Yes. So obviously there's so much crossover with you guys, but oh, I yeah. have to ask you what your dynamic is like. Like what are the pros and cons of being with another former athlete? There's so many more pros. I mean, I have to say that like first of all, him and I are I'm lucky. I found a good one. He's just an amazing guy. Um but I spotted him and I was like I made sure that we met. (laughs) Um, I spotted him a long time before he spotted me, but I would say it's very, you know, passionate conversation. um, And I understand him. So he started, you know, to keep it short and sweet, he started a business a couple of years ago. And because of what we were talking about earlier, like you, as a student athlete, especially at a place like Stanford and Arizona, like, you know, you're working around the clock, you're working 12 hour, bare minimum, 12 hour days. Um, Oftentimes, let's see, 14 or 15 hour days is your freshman year. And, um, you know, that's school, right? That's not just practice, it's school and, and lifting and stuff. And you really understand the level of extra work it takes to be successful. So like, yep especially this last year with him in his business, you know, he's been working 12 hour and often a lot more 12 hour days. And I get it, you know, and he comes home and I'm supportive of it. And, and I think because of that experience, I don't know, or think I would probably be that way if I hadn't gone through that. And so that's part of the good, right. That comes out of it. Also, we, we strive for like unrealistic expectations. So like, it's not like, Hey, you want to go on a hike? It's like, Hey, you want to climb Mount Humphreys, the highest elevation in Arizona. And I'm like, (laughs) yeah, we haven't trained. We haven't done anything. Let's do it. (laughs) And and that's just how him and I are. And we've always loved just being extra with all that (laughs) stuff. You know, I think that's part of being that you know, athlete that put that played at a high level. I can so relate to you. And this is, this is why I asked this question because, so my boyfriend of many years also played football at Stanford. And so we have a similar dynamic Mm -hmm. where we're also competitive though. Like with each other. Yes. Sometimes Uh like, so I would have to ask you, like, have you guys ever like actually directly competed? Like we raced each other for example, oh, okay. have you guys ever done anything like that? Um, oh goodness. He would beat me at everything. First <laughs> of all, he's like twice my size and four five times my strength. I'm not very strong for my size. Um, he always jokes that he lives in my shadow and I'm like, that's just beyond not true. Um, it's just because I grew up in Tucson. And so like being right. in Arizona, right? Like you just, that's how it, Tucson is, is if you're a hometown kid, everybody really like supports you kind of on another level. Um, but he's the guy, he can pick a ball up. It doesn't matter what the ball is. Like he will pick it up and you would have thought he played for 20 years. Like we went skiing and snowboarding and to, for me, it was my first time and it was really obvious. I thought he had gone like 15 times. It was his first time. And he's just like cruising down the mountain. And like, I'm like, he's just, a, he's a freak. He's so athletic. And I wouldn't try to compete with him because I would lose. <laughs> So I don't try because I know I'll lose. Well, to be fair, in our case, 
he was uh, an offensive lineman. So okay, he's yeah. like twice my size. Yeah. And so I was just able in our race, I did win for the record. We've yeah. been talking. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We've been talking about it for years. Oh, and we, I like, believe that. Yes. And finally just one night, like did it with our friends there. So there's like video, there's evidence. We haven't had any kind of like rematch or anything <laughs> since then, but, oh. but like, he's also like so much bigger than me. So I don't know how right. totally fair that was, but I know. Yeah, it's cute though. I mean, the competitiveness is there. It's like learning how to channel it in the right ways. Right, right. Because it can also go off the rails. <laughs> it can. <laughs> it can. It's I like, feel like everyone's had that like family monopoly game that has just like oh yeah <laughs> snowballed. Yeah. I mean, that's part of the reason why I was able to compete at the level I did. We had a family of five, and I was the youngest. And I was constantly trying to earn a place at the table. It didn't matter what we were doing. Everyone, all my siblings are athletic. I'm not the most athletic in my family. And they never let me win. Um, And they would destroy me. Like if we would do a basketball game and I'm like 10 years younger than my brother, you'd think he'd like let me win. Nope. He would, (laughs) it'd be like 30 to zero. He'd be like slam dunking on me during a a one-on-one and like, I would just feel terrible about myself afterwards, but it created this like, you know, this like, oh, I'm going to go out and practice and beat him or at least get a few points the next go around. It's so, it's true though. Like, it's so funny. I do feel like sometimes like depending on what order you were born in, in your family, like oldest, youngest, like sometimes your personalities are shaped or, and even like the way you play can be shaped by that because you like have that whatever that chip is on your shoulder. Yeah, it's so true. I think the the order, I call it the lineup, like the family lineup (laughs) really determines a lot about how, who you are. Totally. Mm -hmm. It totally does. Cause the baby's always going to be different than the oldest. Oh yeah. And I don't want to be anything but the baby. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I love being the baby. (laughs) Yeah. I'm the baby too. Um, yeah, and I, I feel that older brothers are fun too. I have an older brother. And, and so that I, I agree with you, like the dynamic is they push you in a good way, but they're protective too. So it's, yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's funny, man. I think the other thing with families and actually maybe even with your husband too, is like the fighting over the TV situation. I don't even try. <laughs> you don't, don't even attempt. <laughs> He's been watching The Office for like seven years or however. And I just am like, all right, like, I'll go with it. And then if I try something new, he's like, what? (laughs) What are you doing? You know? (laughs) Yeah. It's funny because my boyfriend and I have an understanding with the TV, specifically for like watching sports that basically like from February, like the start of softball season till maybe August, I'm kind of in control of the TV because it's my season. (laughs) It is your season. That's a good role. (laughs) Yeah. And then from, you know, maybe the end of August or September till the Super Bowl in the beginning of February, which is like right before softball season, the TV is his (laughs) for the most part. That's cute. See, my husband loves softball. He loves it. And I love, of course, that he loves it. So he enjoys watching it. Um, And I love college football. I don't really care about pro football. If it's someone we know, we'll watch and enjoy it. But um, we both love those two sports. And so it's I'd say pretty easy going in our household when it comes to the TV because it's like, oh yeah, the game's on, right? Or U of A softball's playing and he would never think to turn it off because he lo- he loves watching it. Yeah, I love that. So that is the one area too. If it's like, if it's Stanford football or Stanford softball, yeah, we're watching no it. Right. <laughs> no matter what. Yes, yeah. like, I'm with you. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Does he like ask you a lot of questions about softball while you guys watch and like to get the inside scoop? Um, He did when we were first together because he had no idea about like the most uh, he had been exposed to the sport was 
his high school team, which he went to a very, very, very small school. And when I say small, I think his graduating class was like 42 people. Oh, wow. So you want to like imagine, you know, their softball program wasn't very competitive. And so he was used to like, I mean, the girls were probably throwing 50, you know, and yeah. then he comes to a game and you're seeing like high 60s and he just was like, what? <laughs> like he said the first game he went to, he was like, dang, like these girls can play. And then the first game he went to was actually like when him and I first, like he, he spotted me in the bullpen and um, went into the stands and figured out who I was. And it was kind of cute, but I had, like I said, I had spotted him like a year prior. <laughs> <laughs> that is really cute though. I love that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's nice too, because we're joking about like maybe the competing or whatever, but there is that level. Like you said, you totally support what your husband's doing now. It's like you hype each other up too. You also know how to be teammates. You know, I mean, absolutely. Like when you're a good teammate, uh, you can be, and you can transfer that into being a good spouse. Like, you know, you kind of each have your time to shine in your relationship and And I think when you understand too, when you're a teammate, you understand like roles, right? Like each player has a specific role and that can go hand in hand when you're uh, not only a spouse, but a parent too. like, he'll come in, you know, he'll come home sometimes and he'll see that I'll need a break, right? Like from being with the kids and he just steps right in and takes on the role. And I think you really recognize like, you know, we're pretty in tune with each other though. So like recognize when the other one needs you to step up, um, you know, think about like when you're hitting, right. And you're, you're not able to, you're not hitting, it's just not working. Then like coach would always say, step up defensively, let someone else step up offensively, right. You're all going to have your time to shine and being able to let the other one shine and, like a teammate shine. Right. And being happy for them. Like, yeah. So it's like having to make that adjustment and recognize it, like you said. And I think catchers though, have to be great at that because of the relationship with the pitcher. So like, Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. But, but, and even read them to see like, okay, like this pitch not working today. Right. Like, and, and seeing how their confidence is all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, but, and with you and Taryn, how did that dynamic kind of work back so when you guys I were would, winning? <laughs> I would definitely say that Taryn and I had, like, on the field, a better dynamic than any other pitcher, better relationship than any other pitcher um, that I had previously caught for at, at Arizona. Um, she was the type of pitcher who wanted that relationship. You know, some pitchers like being – in their circle or on their island and they don't really want your feedback or they want to call the shots. And I, I understand that, you know, you know, your body and your mind better than anybody else. Um, but the battery is what I love. I love the battery. I love the relationship. I love being able to walk out and tell a joke or talk about something completely unrelated to just get their mind off of you know, like the sport's big, but it's not bigger than life. Right. Um, and you know, there's always dynamics off the field too. And so being able to, Karen and I did a really good job of separating like off the field with on the field. And I I would say in general, our team did a pretty good job of that. Um, you get a lot that can happen with 17 girls. Right. (laughs) Um, and I will tell you, at Arizona, that was something we took pride in was whatever happened off the field stayed off the field. And then we were there sisters, I mean, had each other's back when we were in between those lines. Sisters is definitely the right word. Yeah. I'm really proud of Taryn. She, I'm really proud of Taryn. I could like cry talking about (laughs) it. Um, Taryn from what, from who Taryn was, and she was a great person back when we played, but who she is now and, and what she's had to go through in her personal life. I'm like so proud of who she's become and, and 
so proud that she is coaching on our team. I think she's the right fit for the job. And I mean, the girls, like, she's got so many accolades, like, two, I think she has like two SBs. I don't even know what she has because she has so much. And um, she's just, she's done a great job. Yeah. Well, that's really sweet. And I would have to say, I think not to speak for her, but I'm sure she would say that you were a part of that as well. And yeah, I think she would. She's, she's good about that. She gives yeah. credit where credit's due, you know? Yeah. Actually, I'm thinking back. This was before I was on the team, but I remember some of the older girls my freshman year saying that I think when Arizona came to play, when you guys came to Stanford, there were some young fans waiting for Taryn, like, Taryn, Taryn, can I have your autograph? And um, thinking about it now from what you just said, like, that's, that's really cool. But at the time, I don't know if the Stanford girls were loving it. Right. (laughs) But, but, you know, like well-deserved for everything that you all did. Yeah. And she was always very good about that with the, with the younger generation and making sure, you know, she was never above that. Um, There's a lot of pictures out there, at least from my era who were like that. Um, and she always took the time to sign an autograph or take a picture, you know, when she could, right. When time permitted, um, often like we'd have to pull her off the field, right? Like we got to go, we got a flight to catch, you know, but she was like a mini celebrity. She, She was in our community and, um, and in the softball community at that time, like a mini celebrity. Well, and the Arizona fan base is unbelievable. Too. Oh yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I good and bad. Like I always joke, I always tell this story when I was a freshman, I, I struck out looking and one of our fan, one of our fans, might I add, who was, <laughs> and this is just how our fans were. He was at the top of the stadium and I could hear him on the field and he's like, you got to swing the bat to hit the ball, Balco. And to this day, like our fans, I mean, they loved us, but they let us know if we weren't, you know, performing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not just you guys telling each other. You have your fans like oh, yeah. letting you know too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I know that they would let us know when we were ever there. Oh, for sure. <laughs> they would definitely let yeah. us know. <laughs> so. there, you, you know, you'd come back from the World Series. I think my freshman year, I think we got four. And which it's funny because I don't even know, because this is the, you come home and people are like, what happened? You know, (laughs) what happened? And that's how it is. It is like, how come you guys didn't win? And, you know, at a lot of programs, like fourth is amazing, right? right? Fourth is amazing. And that's a, and it's, you know, never satisfied. (laughs) That's how you do it though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I could keep talking to you forever, but, um, I, I I know so much (laughs) always, I mean, would love to have you on the show again at some point if you're up for it, but I would love love to to. wrap up with Mm -hmm. a little game called safer out that I play with everyone. And basically, yeah, I'll ask you a question or just bring up a topic and you'll say if it's safer out. If you like okay. it or you agree with it, it's safe. If you don't, it's out. Does that make okay. sense? Yes, it does. Okay. So bringing purses into the dugout before the game, safe or out? Out now because of cell phones. <laughs> True. But Okay. You guys used to do that though, right? Yeah, I mean, like, depends, right? <laughs> okay, start over. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fair. That's okay. That's fair. But but I remember, didn't you guys used to do that? I remember seeing when oh, we yeah. were, yeah. Yeah, what? and I, I don't think, um, it wasn't really a problem. I don't remember it being an issue. I don't remember it being a problem. Um, but if I was a coach, I would say out because there's just too many distractions with your phone. Yeah. Well, that's very definitely true now more than ever, but I remember back then, I remember seeing the yeah. team walking across the field with their purses going into the dugout when we were in Tucson and we were like, wait, but why? Like, what do you need in your purse? Oh, it, it was an accessory. 
<laughs> right. Like, I think at the time we were like, what could this possibly right. serve for them? And it's like, that's not There's what it's no about. Purpose. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's come on. Funny. <laughs> okay. Okay. So fair. Um, all right. Second one is coaches calling pitches, not catchers. Safe or out? Safe. Safe. Okay. I yeah, didn't know I because. Did. Well, because that happened with me. Um, you know, if I'm, if I'm just being really transparent, I wish that it didn't happen. And I wish I, I had been maybe coached more on calling a game rather than just like, Hey, you know, I'm sure they didn't like how I called the game. I would assume that, which is why Nancy ended up calling it. But, you know, Nancy would, her and I would talk, of course, like in between innings and she'd get my feedback. And then there were a couple times where prime example in 06, the last pitch of the game, I take pride in that. I called that pitch um, because Nancy kept going outside, 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 outside. Um, and I said, bring it in, like, just let's go. She's been fouling it off like, like 10 times. And I think, you know, in those moments, I felt like that ownership of like, I'm feeling this, let's do this. And, but overall, you know, Nancy had the book and she had more access to what did this girl do last time? Um, but I think it's safe, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I kind of roll my eyes, but I'm like, I get it, you know? Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, and maybe even from what you just said, maybe it's almost this, it's more of like a team effort, uh, you I think know? So. Yeah, you feel, but I, I don't think that's a reason to not really educate and teach and coach your catcher. Like your catcher should be able to call the game. And I think you should have your catcher call the games that maybe aren't your, you know, national championship or whatever, like give them, give them 30 or 40% of the games and teach them and let them earn it, you know, rather than just taking it from them before you really let them or before you educate them. I was never taught how to call a game. Like I just did it when I was younger. I just did it. And so I wish they would have, you know, taken more time to coach me on that. I feel like that's across the board in softball, something that is becoming a little bit of like a lost art almost. And that maybe we should, yeah, we should like invest back into that more. Yeah. I think, you know, after we're talking about it, I, I actually think my opinion would probably be more out, but you know, there's a balance, right? You can't just throw them in the fire. So it's like, hey, let's figure out the games to call and the games to not. And then when you're probably an upperclassman, like let her go, right? Yep. If she keeps messing up and isn't proving herself, then get the reins on a little bit more. But but maybe it also depends on the relationship with the pitcher, right? Like that, it like the chemistry you have, yeah. you know, like, like maybe it can be a case by case too. Like, yeah. There's pictures I was not in tune with. Um, I was on a very different page, you know, right or wrong. You know, I think you can be successful in different ways, like different approaches. So trust, right. Trust. Yeah. So maybe that's it. It's really not like black or white in this case. It's yeah. Cause if a pitcher doesn't trust your call, it ain't going to work. <laughs> right. Totally. Yeah. 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 Well, I guess those are, that's kind of a concept to live by too. Yeah. <laughs> like trust. Yeah. Hey. yeah. <laughs> you can feel that from someone. Totally. Yeah. It's a good lesson. Well, thank you again for joining. This was super fun. Thank you. Absolutely. I had a blast. So call me anytime. <laughs> <laughs> It was awesome to hear about Calissa's just winner mentality, that pit bull approach that she mentioned when she was on the field and just even in her life now and everything that she's learned, you know, all the relationships she's built, because that's, that's really what it's all about. So with that, let's transition to the foul tip of the week. This week's foul tip is about taking things one pitch at a time. 
this is one of those things that I feel like we've all heard before, but maybe we kind of dismiss it a little bit and take it for granted and don't necessarily look deeper into the knowledge that's really behind it. But if you think about it, I mean, how many pitches does it take to get a hit? A double, a triple, even a home run. It only takes one. It doesn't matter what the count is, what happened in your last at bat or anything else. All that matters is that next pitch, right? So it's easy for us to get caught up in other things. I mean, look at what Alabama and Montana Fouts said about last season. When I was at Stanford too, I mean, we wrote our personal and team goals every year and sent them to our coaches. And freshman year, I remember I had these personal goals, like hit over 300 in the Pac-12, which is not easy back then, especially when you're facing people like Daniel Laurie, make all conference, become an All-American. And while it's great to have goals, and I worked my butt off, I struggled at the plate that year. And there were a lot of factors as to why, but a lot of it was really mental. And I realized later in my career that I shouldn't be focusing on the outcome so much, but rather the present. And it wasn't until I truly lived by this philosophy that I found myself as a hitter. And that was really my senior year, if I'm honest. I mean, I stopped thinking about everything else and just took it one pitch at a time. And without even thinking about it, I did hit 331 that year and made all conference. And that was just being me, not thinking about too many other things. And it's a metaphor for life too. When we get too caught up in outcomes before they happen and overanalyzing and we don't live in the present, the present is all we can control. And it's also where we can enjoy life one day at a time, one moment at a time, especially in the craziness of the world today. So it's just another way that softball helps us become better people. So that's it. Take things one pitch at a time. That's the foul tip of the week. You've been listening to Believe in Softball, available anywhere you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, and wherever else you listen, including Believe.com. Check us out on YouTube now as well, where you can actually watch the episodes. Hit that subscribe button, rate the show, write a review, share it with your friends. Of course, follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Believe in Softball. Again, B-L-E-A-V. You can always, always hit me up on Twitter at JennaBecerra01 and Instagram at JennaBecerra as well. Thanks for tuning in and catch you soon.